Are you there? Are you in Psalms 107? Are you there? This is a beautiful chapter. Um, there are phrases throughout this chapter that are repeated for reasons that they are repeated. And when we get to that point, I'm going to ask you to read them with me. This particular chapter has been called the Old Testament love feast because of the beautiful, encouraging words that we have in this particular passage of Scripture. All God's word is that way, but this in particular is just really precious. Uh, the very first verse gives us the, the beginning and the introduction of the chapter, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good. And his mercy endureth how often? Forever, forever, forever. If you need to have forgiveness in your life, you'll find it in this chapter. If you need deliverance, you'll find it. If you need restoration, you'll find it in this chapter. And we will read that final verse together when I get to the finishing of, this, of the message. We'll read that final verse together. In this chapter, we have a revelation of God's long suffering and his loving kindness, even toward those who are rebellious and are disobedient. And so it proves that God will never walk out of any of his children. In fact, that's the title of my message. God won't walk out on you. We can embrace his loving kindness in our trial. But the title of the message is God won't walk out on you. This psalm gives us four different classifications of God's people who end up in trouble and affliction because of their own doings. The Lord doesn't walk out on any of us, not one. So as we look at these classifications or categories, we'll see if you can find yourself in any of these categories. The first category that we look at is the believer in, is in trouble because he is either starving or he's thirsty, maybe both. He's starving and first thirsty. Look at verses 4 and 5. This is where I got that. They wandered in the wilderness in a desolate way. They found no city to dwell in. And what are the next two words? Three words, hungry and thirsty. Their soul fainted in them. You see, these people once knew the fullness of the Lord, but now they're in a solitary wilderness, wandering alone and unable to find the city. Now, when it mentions the city in the Old Testament, it's always, usually always, means Zion or Jerusalem. It usually always means the city of Jerusalem. Well, in our study today, it represents God's true church. We are his true church. When we speak of the true church, we're talking about that part of the church that God will take in the rapture. We know there are true Christians in all kinds of denominations. And when I say all kinds, I should probably be more distinct, of course, those that believe that Jesus Christ is the only way. But there are all kinds of denominations that do teach that, that he is the way. And of course, we know that there probably will be some also in other walks and denominations that will be true Christians that have called upon the Lord and have asked to be saved. So we're talking about the true church. That church, when the rapture takes place, God will pull his people out and they will leave in the rapture. That's why we call it those who belong to the true church. And so the scripture says, they were hungry and thirsty. There are multitudes, and I believe there's more than you, than you can actually think about. Today, there are many Christians that are starving for a true word from the Lord. Do you believe that? I can tell you during this pandemic that probably many people, uh, like we ourselves, were secluded. We're bound up in our houses and not going anywhere to worship. I know there was quite a few people looking at my messages on Facebook, and, and, and that's, that's a good thing, that people are searching. They're hungry. They're thirsty. And they're hungry for God's word. And I believe that there are many that are hungry for God's word. Maybe, maybe there's some that are going from church to church trying to find their place. 
And maybe, perhaps, there will be even some that may just give up because they believe there isn't a church for them. But I know that there is. I know there is a place. And, and if you haven't really for sure found your place, you just be patient because I can tell you that God will not walk out on you. He has not forgotten about you. And I can tell you that, that he loves you and he knows exactly what you're doing and, and, uh, and what's involved right now in your life, in this time in your life. There's some pastors and congregations that perhaps aren't even interested in righteousness. And that's sad for me. That's sad when I hear that, that there's so many, some, so many churches that, that, are, that are not preaching God's word. You know, they're talking about all kinds of other things. Um, they're concerned about meeting the needs of the people. So they, they fix their schedule to, to be full of, act, of lots of activities. Uh, maybe, uh, maybe family nights at sporting events or whatever it might be. So they try to do all these things. Uh, and activities, but you know what the best activity is? The preaching of God's word is the best activity for a church to have. Preach God's word. Preach his word. Be instant in season and out of season. Of course, we know that there are some uh, people that are so critical minded that, that they become hard to please, that no church ever seems to meet their standards. The least imperfection seems to drive them away. I, I knew of a pastor who received an angry letter because his church bulletin had mentioned singles night. The letter writer accused the church of trying to pair up lovers. Can you imagine that? The pastor answered that this way. He was simply announcing a night of ministry for single people to worship God together. That was his only reason for it. So if you want to be a pastor, you put your application in and see how that works out for you. There's just some people you can't please. I've learned a long time ago to just give up on that. <laughs> I'm not here to be a people pleaser. So if I say something that you might be upset with, well, if the cat gets its fur rubbed the wrong way, let the cat turn around. That's what I always say. Now, if it's something I said, then you come see me. If I said it and I offended you, you come see me. Don't tell anybody else, come see me. If I did it, because I want to know about it. But if God did it, you'll have to take it up with him. You know what I mean? You'll have to take it up with him. See, see how that works out for you. Without regular fellowship among true believers, any Christian can end up being cold and leaving your first love, wandering around continually, thirsty, hungry, sampling. And sometimes you can sample some unhealthy doctrines doing that. And sometimes... You may end up isolated and bitter. I've met some like that too. Just simply isolated and bitter. They've never found the church to suit them. And so in his mercy, look at verse 6 and 7 with me. In God's mercy, what was the answer for that? Here it is. Read it with me. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses, and he led them forth by the right way that they might go to a city of habitation. God provided a solution. We just read it. God says, I will show you my church. I'll lead you right to them. He will guide you to that place that he has, where he has his body of believers, and he has them all over the world. And if you're willing to cry out to him, he will miraculously bring those like-minded Christians to you, and you'll be amazed at how much you'll see things alike. You'll be amazed at those people God will put you in touch with, of how they feel the same way as you do. So until that happens, he will not walk out on you. He promises to manifest himself even where, the scripture says, two or three are gathered in his name. So that brings me to the second kind of believer in trouble who has fallen into sin by disobedience to God's word. Being disobedient to God's word. And here's where I get that if you're looking in your Bible, verses 10, 11, and 12. Those who sat in darkness and in the shadow of death, bound in affliction and irons, and here's the, here's the reason why, because they rebelled 
against the words of God and despised the counsel of the Most High. Therefore he brought down their heart with labor. They fell down and there was none to help. Could this be you? Have you sat under godly convincing preaching? The spirit has striven with you, but still you sinned willfully. And now you're back in the clutches, perhaps of an old habit. You're miserable. Your heart brought down with labor is what the scripture says. When one sins willfully and disobeys the word of God, his tendency is to hide and cover in fear and wallow in, mis in misery. He thinks it's all over, that God can't use him anymore. And that's the lie that the devil tries to whisper to you, that there is no hope for you. You're one of those people who will never change. Your sin has forced God to hide his face from you. But here's God's answer to that. Are you with me? Verses 13, 14, 15, and 16. Let's read it. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. He brought them out of darkness and the shadow of death and break their bands in sunder. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness and for his wonderful works to the children of men. For he hath broken the gates of brass and cut the bars of iron in sunder. Isn't that beautiful? That's God's answer. He saved them out of their distresses. Oh, that men would give thanks to the Lord for his goodness. So hear it well, church. God never has and never will hide his face from a crying child. It doesn't matter how far you have fallen. It doesn't matter how many promises to God you have made and broken. Your sins, though as scarlet or red, will be white as snow. If you will only cry out to him, only God can cut the bars asunder. Only he can deliver you from your darkness. This is our strength and this is our hope. And then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he saved them. I want you to notice the, the phrase there. They cried out to the Lord in their trouble. You should underline that. The sufferers in this psalm didn't cry out to God after they were out of their mess. They cried out from within it. And what did God do? He saved them. That's good to understand. They cried in the midst of their problems. Right in the middle of it. That's when you cry out to God. Some of you know what I'm talking about. You've been there. You've done that. You didn't have to call the preacher up. You did it on your own. Praise the Lord for that. You can do that. He's always on the throne. You don't need a preacher or a pastor. You can do that on your own. I'm so tickled when I hear that you do that. That, that just, it just puts a spring in my step. That's what you need to do. You can do this. You don't need me. You can do that on your own. Here's the third kind of believer that we see in trouble. Is a fool who has brought trouble on himself. Oh boy, that hit me over the head real good. Because of their, listen, here, here's where I get this. Look at verse 17 and 18. I want to show you where I'm getting this. A believer who brought trouble upon himself. Look, look at where I found it. Fools, because of their transgression and because of their iniquities, were afflicted. Their soul abhorred all manner of food, and they drew near to the gates of death. Now, the dictionary says a fool is someone who lacks judgment or good sense. Or one who makes silly, stupid mistakes. Boy, did that hit everybody. Me included. He does his own thing without thinking of the consequences. Have you ever done that? Boy, I have. Phew. And many Christians are paying a high price for their past acts of foolishness. Some spent a night in adultery and have contracted perhaps HIV. Some are sinking in financial holes because of a foolish spending habit. Others are locked in a terrible marriage because they rushed into it foolishly. <laughs> I heard that. The despair of many of such Christians is unspeakable. They feel helpless. 
and on the verge of giving up. One man wrote, I feel like my life is over. There's nothing I can do. I just look forward to death. These tragic words reflect the psalmist's description of this type of despair. They drew near to the gates of what? Death. Any of you went through that, you know exactly what those words mean. You know what those words mean. How close have you felt like you were to the gates of death? Mm. Tragic words. Listen, I'm here to tell you today, you don't have to live without hope. God has given you his promise that he does not walk out on foolish people. He doesn't do that. He will never do that. And so what's the answer to it? Well, look there with me, verse 19 and 20. Read it with me. Verse 19, then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble. He saveth them out of their distresses. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Ooh, there it is. Oh, that men would praise the Lord for his goodness, for his wonderful works to the children of men. I get happy when I read these verses because I know of all the dumb mistakes I've made in my life. And when I see these verses, I get happy because I can identify with them. The Lord knows there's things that we can't change. Words that we have spoken that we can't bring back. But he's not asking us to do any penance or to make any promises. All he asks is that we cry out to him in our desperation because he can heal, he can prolong life, and he can provide supernatural grace. He sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. Verse 20, and God will send someone to you reminding you of his word. And all you have to do is hear his promise and cry out to him. That's all you got to do. And you can do it when you're in the midst of your problems. And then fourthly, it really, it really catches us in this pandemic. This is a, a good fourth one for the pandemic. The fourth kind of believer in trouble is someone swamped by an unexpected storm of life. Boy, don't that fit us right now. Swamped by an unexpected storm of life. As I read these verses, I think of people that are facing troubles in their businesses or their careers. When you turn the news on, isn't that all you think about? It's all you see. What about all these businesses that are closed because of coronavirus? What about the investments they've made in their businesses? And they're closed. They can't open. They, can't, they have trouble paying their bills. Now look how this, this fourth one encompasses that. Look where I'm getting it. I want you to look at verse 23. Look at verse 23. They that go down to the sea in ships that do what? There it is. Has your businesses been affected by coronavirus? Has your business, sure, I bet all of your businesses have in some way been affected by coronavirus. In some way. Some way, shape, or form it has. They are they that go down to the sea in ships that do business in great waters. Those of you that have businesses and careers, I'm talking to you. For he commands and raises the stormy wind which lifts the waves of the sea. They mount up to heavens. They go down again to the depths. Their soul melts because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man. And I have a message on this. And they are wits end. Listen, folks, I believe there's a lot of people at wit's end. If you were a business owner and you had a lot of money invested in your business, you're probably one of those that's at wit's end. If you're listening to me by way of Facebook or any other means, maybe I'm talking about you today. Are you at wit's end? You need to just cry out to him today because he'll help you. He will help you. Business people and career people, are like the seamen that are in these ships. The great waters signify the big world of competition, an ocean of activity. 
suddenly a storm breaks out. It's beyond their control. Waves of problems threatening to swallow their boat. And so their soul melts because of trouble. That's what the scripture says. Can't be much clearer. They were unable to solve their past problems and to escape one crisis after another. And it seems like there's no way of escape from this trial. They are at wit's end. They can't sleep at night for worrying, trying to reason their way out of their trouble. But listen, God alone can calm the storm. He alone can still those threatening waves. He alone can bring gladness and peace and lead you to a safe harbor. Look at verse 28 with me. Read it together with me. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble, and he bringeth them out of their distresses, plural. He calms the storms so the waves are still. Then they are glad because they are quiet. So he guides them to their desired haven. He guides them to their desired haven. Do you need God's guidance today? Cry out to him. Just tell him. I don't know what we're going to do, Lord, but this message I just heard today says I'm just to cry out to you, and that's what I'm going to do. Lord, I need your help. I need your help now. Don't let your situation get into your spirit. Bring it all out before God. Go into your secret closet and cry out everything to him. He can do what you'll never, ever be able to do. He can. He is not about to walk out on you. He is in your battle to the end. No matter how it came upon you, he is in you. He is with you, and he is beside you no matter what. He regardeth their affliction when he heard their cry. Chapter 106 and 44. And then I want you to go to the last verse of this chapter today with me. And we're going to read this last verse together. Verse 43. Whoso is wise and will observe these things, Even they shall understand the loving kindness of the Lord. You understand that, his loving kindness. I ask you all to stand. It's time to go home. Oh, Father in heaven, thank you, thank you, thank you for this message that really spoke to my heart. I really could identify with with all four of them. There was times, Lord, that I I, I could identify with every one of them. I pray, Father, that this message spoke to the hearts of these who will hear it today. And I pray, Lord, that they will learn as I to cry out unto you in their need, in their time of need, cry out unto you. Please help me, Lord. Help me. I need your help right now. I need it. I pray for these who will be watching or listening to this by, by way of the internet. I pray right now for your, for, your, for your problem, for the problem that you're in. I pray right now. Cry out to the Lord, and I know that the Lord will answer your need. He will answer your need. He will come to you because he will not walk out on you. He will not fail you. Call upon him, and he will come to you. Thank you for the opportunity I had today to share this word with these, Lord, this, your people. Thank you for this day. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen. Lord bless you.